and, and so the future doesn't really refer to uh, MSC schemes or archaeology. Uh, I really, I want to talk about class, particularly working class people. Is there a place for working class people in archaeology in the future? And how can we go about providing opportunities for working class people uh, in the future, given the way the academy is going? Um, so MSC schemes uh, did provide an opportunity for working class people to enter archaeology, mainly through unemployment. So I was involved in work archaeology as an MSC person because I was unemployed for a year. Um, and so I did two of those schemes. And each time, in between each scheme, you had to wait for a year to go and work on the next scheme. If you had a degree, you were almost instantly promoted to, you could get a degree and become a project manager on an MSC scheme almost immediately. So it was a great time to be an archaeologist in many ways. You know, you could be running a project with 20 or 30 people uh, more or less straight away. Um, so they were an interesting time uh, to, to be involved in archaeology. So um, around about 1979, Margaret Thatcher came to power. Um, roughly 35% of the population was unemployed. Um, and then another few million people were put onto long-term sick or on various schemes or disability. So it was a very, very bad economic time. Uh, and people were quite angry. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> uh, and, and we had a very sort of violent sense of humor. Um, quite a deranged sense of humor, really, uh, in some ways. So just to give you some figures, um, there are no clear numbers as such. But a National Audit Office report for 1983 suggests that there were 450,000 places for 16 to 18 year olds on YTS scheme. So nearly half a million 16 to 18 year olds had no job. We would now call those people NEETs, but they were all put onto various kinds of employment training schemes. Um, the government were very coy about saying how many people worked on MSC schemes. Um, so we don't actually have any sort of proper numbers. There was an NAO thing for YTS, but I've not been able to actually get a number for MSC schemes. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing. But it was good in the sense that, particularly archaeology and ecology, saw many non-traditional entrants. So you could come and work in archaeology without a degree. Um, I think one of the things to pick up on what was talked about this morning is that at that time, anybody working on an MSC scheme probably couldn't see a long-term future in archaeology. Certainly, I didn't see a long-term future in archaeology. Um, I actually didn't quite, I really didn't like archaeology because I'd worked on MSC schemes. Because I was, there was an element of compunction about it. Um, and because there was no other work. It wasn't really what I saw myself doing. So this is me. Um, I have to thank Ian Barnes for all these pictures because uh, I didn't have a camera at the time. One of the things I want to touch on a little bit is we talk about archaeology as if it's this great public good, but is it really a public good? Is it good for everybody? Does everybody benefit from archaeology? Do the communities in which Heritage Lottery Fund community archaeology projects go, do they really benefit from having three years of a bunch of specialists come in, spend several million pounds and then go away again? Um, certainly when I worked on MSC schemes, I was wondering who was really benefiting. You know, were we benefiting? Were we doing any good for that community? Uh, this is the community I lived in at the bottom here, just to give some idea of sort of like gritty urban landscapes. Um, the no future in the title, in some senses, refers to this community because they've been gentrified out of existence now. Uh, all of that is now uh, gone. And so on that cheery note, I'll hand over to Steve, who's going to provide the light relief. Thank you. So this is truly a bog-off session, because you buy one, you get one free. Uh, this started when Andy and I worked together for a few years now in, in the summer, and we have lively discussions, it should be over pints of beer or whatever, and we come up with stupid ideas. And I haven't written anything about, about this, but we talk about MSC schemes, or we're really talking about how you need an MSC to get a job in archaeology. And he meant Master of Sciences, could be from university, right? And I meant, well, I got my MSC on the M MSC schemes in the northeast of England in the 1980s, where any grim northern town needed an archaeology MSC scheme. And I was thinking about this earlier. Newcastle, Hartlepool, Hull, Wakefield, West Yorkshire, probably missed some out, Middlesbrough, 
all had MSc schemes do, doing archaeology and that's sort of where I sort of cut my teeth, didn't have a degree in archaeology but I had better qualifications. Two, A, I, had, I was unemployed and B, I had a driving licence so I could, I had 12 months of unemployment so I was eligible for the scheme and I could drive a vehicle because I was over 21. So although I had a degree but not in archaeology, I got involved in MSc schemes in, in that way. This is Thought Fuels. Um, mine is a contrast to what Andy's saying, uh, it's a positive story. Andy was saying, and I'm not detriment, saying it to his detriment, that not much came out of it, nothing was published. And now I'm going to say, well, a lot of seminal sites were dug and published and by the people that were, were working there at the time. So that was Thought Fuels. What struck, and that was the site that I worked on, and that's a seminal site for, for the Iron Age in, in the north of England. But what struck me about that, talking about this today, was how many bloody skins there are. None of them had your rescue t-shirts in those days, because we're tough in the north, it could have been, could have been November, you know, we're going to we're in the party after this, so the leaves are all up, they're ready to cut and run. Uh, but you can't do this now. I work on, I've still got a job in archaeology, one have after I've done this, but, uh, uh, but we, we don't dress like this anymore. You have hard hat, gloves, coat, trousers, Full six point six point protection. When I saw that, I was I was really surprised. I borrowed these slides off Robin Daniels, who's the county archaeologist in Hartlepool. Oh, no, oh, my it's broken here. it. Uh, but I, I was sure the, the essence was that a lot of unemployed people worked on MSC scheme in. Thought, thought fuel, fuels there, part of that team. The, but across West, West Yorkshire, I speak, lots of the people that were supervising archaeologists are now sort of some of the archaeologists across the country. My colleague Phil Abramson, that I work, work a lot with, he said, Oh, yeah, I, I was in Castleford, my interview was with, with Phil Mays. He didn't really say much about archaeology. Took me to the site, put my arm around me, and said, Phil, this is Castleford. It's the arsehole of, of Yorkshire, and the river air flows through the middle of it. You'll love it here. <laughs> uh, you know, that's Phil. But it was the same experience as you if you were digging in Hull, Hull, Hull Hell or Hartlepool, which is the Tramps Lament, where the Lord saved me from. Well, they didn't with the MSC students, because we, we was digs in Hull. This is Hartlepool. Again, seminal site, Anglo Saxon Monastery, dug, where Hill. Uh, reigned supreme till 657 AD and Robin, Dan Robin Daniels took the site with a team of about 20 MS MSC students and I did a similar thing, uh, it must be a tea side, there's smoke coming out the top, the top there and took this cemetery at Norton which again was, get this right Steve, God it's good when it works isn't it Look, all these things are published. Uh, Anglo Saxon Cemetery at Norton, Gordon Young at Hartlepool, Dave Heslop dug at Thought Fuels, Robin Dug, and all of these sites were published and there were positive out outcomes from it. MSC stopped in, in 1988 and many of us went, went on to get other jobs. And so um, I think for the first 10 years of my career, uh, I didn't have a career as such, it was just careering around the country. And when I, my mother said, after 10 years, when are you going to get a proper job? Because, uh, you know, we're going from one contract, one contract to, to the other. And to, it's not meant to be all about me. But when I got my PhD, my son said, are you going to get a proper job? And that was only about five years ago. <laughs> but I was, what I wanted to say was MSC was formative in providing jobs for Duncan and myself. Andy, I've spoken to other people about how MSC was involved in, in big projects in the 80s, I was at something in Dorset in, in the autumn and the speaker st stood up and he said that, well it's Niall Charples, he said that it was Dignant Maiden Castle and English Heritage pulled, pulled the funds on the post excavation and the MSC scheme stood in and the t team provided, provided the labour and resources to do the post excavation there. And at that seminar in the autumn to celebrate, celebrate somebody's achievements in archaeology. There was about 15, well, five, sorry, people turn, turned up in sort of le leather jackets and, and wh whatever. And they were all the MSC scheme. And that, what I'm really saying is how, for the MSC scheme and for other people, archaeology's got the power to transform people's lives. And whilst Andy's saying there's no future in it, I'm saying it's all because it's in the past. And to go from 
MSC students look at how people are doing archaeology these days in a similar vein and partly my practice will be saying about that as well. I did an Operation Nightingale working with injured witches, wives and servicemen in 2015. Uh, we did this project as part of my work on, on the on the A1 and obviously op Operation Nightingale is running on to lots of, of other things but it's talking about how archaeology can um, transform, transform people's lives in, in a positive way and I'm still doing that uh, although I'm working highways a lot and for about 48 weeks of the year they say ah, going on, you're going on you see where, where are you going go to Spain go to the beach now I'm going to Yorkshire you are well what are you going to do oh, I'm going to go and do an archaeological dig and then say yeah mad at you because of you do it I'm an advocate for it all, all year don't take time off and go digging because you know we still love it we still got the bug and it's blooming spectacular stuff that was uh, a site where I do this every summer uh, about 100 people have worked at street house with me since 2000, 2004 students people from the house next the house next door lofters from from east Cleveland university students and we're digging a bloody big bloody big hole there it's getting deeper and deeper pretty spectacular it's where i met andy again but really to illustrate that i'm still sort of pioneering, pioneering or champ, championing these are people who have come up from, from Loftus for uh, archaeology open days, such as it is. One year I tried not to have an open day, and three hundred people turned up. <laughs> uh, I was pissing down as well, but but it's really to say something about how MSC scheme was formative and positive for what, what I did, for what a lot of other people that I've spoken to. I was at a Dweezil Pop Zappa concert last week, and sat talking to a bloke and he said, well, I got involved in archaeology because I was working on MSC scheme in, in Bootle for two, for two years. And it's really about how people are getting involved, have got involved in archaeology, like myself, like Andy. And it's sort of, we, that's how, where we got our MSC to sort of undertake archaeology, continue in it and to be a, a force or a power for um, continuing with archaeology. And I know we've had a lot of elections recently, but... You want to have another vote? <laughs> Back to Andy. Thank you. Right. So, uh, so I think where I want to go kind of now with this paper is I just want to think about what are we doing uh, within the discipline to kind of widen participation, to include uh, black and ethnic minority students, uh, and what are we going to do about the table? And I just want to talk about these two documents. Neither of them mentions class. Um, I have a few words to say about class, really. Uh, class is not part of the 2010 Equalities Act. Uh, it is not part, as far as I'm aware, of the Chief for Equality and Diversity group, except as inclusion, but we'll come back to that. Um, and class acts as a multiplier to discrimination. So the difficulties that you face if you are protected under the Equalities Act, which are age, disability, gender reassignment, race, religion, belief, sexual orientation, marriage, civil partnership, and pregnancy and maternity, all those will be multiplied by your class status. Um, so these documents don't really discuss class. And in fact, if you want to start searching social class on Google, Google often will not direct you towards papers on class. So Google tends to think of class now as a class of students. So if you search on class in education, you'll end up with a whole bunch of comics about kids in class. So class is being replaced by the government by a it's been gently whitewashed and replaced by a series of acronyms. So there's EIMD, e Polar, Tundra, and another of other statements. And better off members of the working class uh, are being rebagged. So skilled trades are now entrepreneurs. You know, your plumber is not a plumber, he's an entrepreneur. And poorly paid white collar workers are now the precariat. Uh, and so workers are dismantled and rebagged and salami sliced into these disparate groups. So they lack a kind of unity of purpose that they used to have. And, and so all that you're left with is a run for the poorest workers and people who don't work, so the underclass. So I was a member of the underclass for a few years. I've been working class, been lots of different classes. Uh, so who wants to identify with that? You know, you're not going to want to identify with something that's got so few uh, positive uh, perspectives. And I thought Caitlin's talk was absolutely brilliant about that uh, yesterday. Um, so, reflections on archaeology, however, does at least talk about BAME. 
Whereas 21st century challenges for archaeology just talks about, I don't know, bureaucracy. Um, so if we look at education, is it a gatekeeper or is it a facilitator? So these are the members of Higher Education Archaeology UK. You can see that Cambridge left in 75 people from low participation neighbourhoods, about 3% of the population. And these are total numbers to the university. Uh, you can see that um, Chester's very good, lets in about 20% of students from low participation <coughs> neighbourhoods. And so that's about the right number. Something like 40% of the student population is from a low participation neighbourhood. So if you're doing 20%, that's pretty good in my book, really. Um, various universities. Uh, Bolivar, who's an uh, academic at Durham, she did this cluster analysis of universities, because universities are organised into all sorts of weird and wonderful groups. Basically, you have one to four. Um, Archaeology is offered mostly at universities at one and two uh, and three. Um, she says that Cambridge and Oxford are just on their own, and I agree with her. They've got twice as much money as all the other universities put together. Uh, the group two are the old universities, so they're the elite universities. They tend to not let in a lot of students from uh, poorer backgrounds. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so between 3.7% uh, and 9.6%. So between 95 and 440 total admissions to each university. Uh, that's based on an acronym called POLAR3. Um, so are we actually facilitating widening participation with this model of university? Uh, is one thing I want to ask. Oh yeah, and the map is of the locations of universities. And you see most universities actually sit in neighbourhoods and in um, environments that are um, less well off. Uh, the English Index of Multiple Deprivation suggests that most universities are actually kind of these little bubbles of wealth surrounded by less well off communities. Which brings me on to my next point. Do universities represent their local population? So this is a great map of the British census done by um, uh, this chap, and each dot represents a person. So blue are white British people, or white ethnic minority groups, um, and green are black, and red are Asian. So this is Manchester. <clears throat> Manchester actually uh, has quite a good record over the last four years of admitting black and ethnic minority students. So it has about 18% um, Asians, which is about the number of Asian people there are that live in Manchester. It has about 4% black, which is about half the number of black people who live in Manchester. So universities very often have a conceptual catchment of where their students, they want their students to come from. And it has a local catchment of people who are very often denied entry to those universities. So Manchester doesn't have a very good record <coughs> of letting in white working class kids, about 8%, which is not very good when they're actually the majority of people who surround that university. So what do we want to do about this? How are we going to facilitate? How are we going to widen participation? How are we going to get these great kids into university so that they can have the opportunities uh, that we've had? Well, universities are doing some stuff. Because remember, archaeology is a profession now. So you need a degree to become an archaeologist. Um, and so if we want working class people to become archaeologists, they have to get degrees. Um, and then they have to go on to do uh, perhaps at uh, masters and other things. So I just want to compare these two. So, so universities do a variety of things. Uh, Manchester has a foundation degree. People make what they call contextual offers. There is an issue in that the offer on the website is often much higher than the offer that often gets made. So you students will look at the offer on the website and go, well, I'm not going there. There's not a kind of health chance I'll get. So you have to think about how you're presenting yourself. Uh, and I just want to talk about some good practice in terms of uh, contextual offers. Um, the website for UCLan states, our typical offer is 104 UCAS points. We operate a flexible admissions policy 
and treat everyone as an individual. This means that we will take into consideration your educational achievements and predicted grades, together with your application as a while, working experience and personal statement. General studies accepted. Um, the one for Durham, which is the one on the other side, which you probably can't read, says, to be eligible for an offer under this scheme, you must meet at least two of the three following criteria. Your home address postcode is classified as quintile one of polar four, NPL, asterisk. Your home address postcode is classified as acorn four or five. Your current or most recently attended school is classified as a UK state school. And I mean, that's just such a damning statement, saying that you have to go to a state school to get a contextual offer. It's like, what does this tell you about Durham? It tells you that they don't let in very many scallies like me. You don't want scumbags kind of messing up the college system. So I think, just to kind of finish this little rant, we need some radical action. We need to think about decolonializing the curriculum. What are we actually teaching? Are we teaching things that are of interest to people who aren't bog standard middle class students? We need to democratize our institutions. We perhaps need to repurpose universities internally so that we move away from this neoliberal model to a model where lecturers and teaching staff actually have a say in how the universities run and what it does. We need to diversify the audience in which we're looking at so that we can go out into local communities and work with them. And there's some very good practice around that in the world, uh, in the university sector. We need to empathise with people who aren't like ourselves. So, you know, a lot of working class kids will grow up traumatised because growing up as a working class poor kid, there will be opportunities for trauma. Uh, and so we maybe need to think about bringing in trauma-informed teaching into our practice. A lot of students have mental health difficulties these days. How do we manage that within the system? We need to engage and represent our local community. It's no good universities existing as these little islands of privilege in these very underprivileged communities. You know, the photos I was showing you of Hume, Hume is like a mile away from the University of Manchester, and it's been demolished now, but Moss Side's still there. And Moss Side and Rush are like a million miles away from the culture of the University of Manchester. Same thing for Kensington and Liverpool. You know, Kensington, all these middle class students come and they all live in Kensington, they all say, oh, I'm getting work life experience. It's like, no, you're not. You just in a shitty neighbourhood for a while. It's a tourist thing, it's not the same thing. Uh, and I met this poet at the weekend, he's called Kate Bailey. Uh, he's from Birmingham, he's a teacher. He goes to National Trust <coughs> properties and he writes poetry about his engagement with those places. Because it seems to him that, you know, he's looking at something that came from Africa on a wall that says, do not touch. And he thinks, well, who has touched that? You know, who's been touched by that? object, which originally came from, you know, where he ultimately came from. And he says, knowledge and the keeping of knowledge and the passing on of knowledge is all part of keeping hold of power. So if we keep education restricted to a small number of people, we actually maintain our power structures and we stop that process of democratization and we stop that process of engagement. Now me and Steve both benefited from uh, being on MSC schemes. Ultimately, I did grow to like archaeology, and I did grow to like community projects. But I'm very aware of the fact that community projects, you know, they need to engage the community. They can't just be helicoptered in and helicoptered out uh, in the way that they're currently been doing. Um, and so, because we were all very miserable at the session yesterday, I looked at this quote. Uh, we were in a session on radicalism, and everybody was very sad. But I don't think we need to be sad. <laughs> so uh, this is from Spinoza, who was a philosopher in the 18th century, uh, which was then rewritten by um, uh, an environmental philosopher called Arnie Nace. The remedy or psychotherapy against sadness caused by the world's misery is to do something about it. It's very common to find those who constantly deal with extreme misery to be more than usually cheerful. According to Spinoza, the power of the individual is infinitely small compared with that of the entire universe. So we must not expect to save the whole world. 
The main point is that of activeness. So I think what we've talked about today is how to be active. And if we can all just be active in our own little bits, hopefully the world will be a better place. Thank you.